Hi there. Uh, it's good to see you all. My name's Murray Anderson. I'm uh, speaking at Crossword and looking forward to that. And I think I'm doing the second talks. So I think Justin Moat will do the first session each day, and I think I'm going to talk uh, kind of later in the morning. And what I thought I'd speak on, uh, I'll do four talks. Uh, really trying to give some of the evidence for Christianity. I'm just aware that the more I talk to my friends about Christian things, uh, I'm, I get responses where people are just confused. And uh, I want to try and deal with some of the, the big questions about Jesus. And so the talks will be a mixture of kind of giving uh, information about Jesus, what we call apologetics, and, and kind of giving the case for Jesus. Uh, but then we'll move on to Bible passages as well, where we'll see what the Bible says and how the Bible gives uh, evidence. So the four topics that I've chosen, if I can just bring up the PowerPoint here. Um, so Christianity really, is it, is it really true? And those are the four questions I'll try to answer. Did Jesus really do miracles? Did Jesus really have to die? Did Jesus really rise again? And is Jesus really coming back? So what I'll do now is I'll just, just take you through each of the talks and uh, just mention the Bible passages that I'll be dealing with. And you could read up on those, read up on, those uh, on your own. And I'll mention a few other things that uh, will hopefully be, uh, be helpful. But you'll just hopefully at the end of this video clip, you'll know uh, kind of roughly uh, where I'm headed with the four sessions. So the first one, uh, did Jesus really do miracles? I'll look at um, three Bible passages with this one, and I'm trying to deal with three main objections in this talk. And the first objection is really just about the record of the miracles. So um, is the record itself dodgy? Is the Bible dodgy? I should say up front that the... Um, the reason for, for doing this series is it's firstly, to, of course, to help those who genuinely have these questions. And I think a lot of the teenagers on the camp will, will actually want to get answers to these questions. But, it, but then also, even for those who are convinced Christians, I'm hoping to give them the kind of answers that will equip them to then answer their friends in future. So hopefully these talks will be helpful to non-Christians, but also to Christians. Anyway, objection one in the first talk. Did Jesus really do miracles? And the first objection is, well, is the, is the record itself dodgy? Is the Bible dodgy? And it's interesting. So with all these talks, I'll be looking at Luke's gospel. And a um, good place to turn to answer this objection is obviously right at the beginning of Luke. Uh, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things uh, you have been taught. Now, this is a really a helpful passage. You'll see just the, um, the length that Luke goes to, just to show how carefully he wrote this all down. Firstly, uh, this was stuff that was handed down. Uh, to them from the first eyewitnesses, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't legend. These were people who had actually seen the events. Uh, verse three: He himself carefully investigated this. Um, he was a medical doctor, of course, and um, he carefully investigated all the all the accounts and spoke to him, spoke to the eyewitnesses, and then he he put it all together in an orderly account. But his aim in doing this is for his friend Theophilus, who was probably a, a, a Roman ruler. Uh, or aristocrat, and um, he put together this orderly account so that Theophilus um, may know the certainty, you see in verse 4 there, he may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. So either, th either Theophilus was becoming a Christian or he was a young Christian, and Luke uh, put together his gospel and then the book of Acts to, to help Theophilus, <clears throat> so that Theophilus might have certainty about the Christian faith. Um, <clears throat> I'll say more things um, about the Bible, uh, but just and we're going to do some of the evidence as to why we can trust the biblical record of miracles. And my my aim will be to show that um, the record itself isn't dodgy. Uh, but having covered that, some people may just say, "Look, I don't care what's written down in the Bible. 
I don't care how valid the Bible is. I don't care how accurate the Bible is. I just know because of, because of science, I know that miracles just can't happen. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at a, a, for this we'll go actually to, um, to talk briefly about the virgin birth because that's a massive miracle that uh, obviously people can't always get their heads around. Uh, it just, it makes sense to me that um, although we're dominated these days in our schools and in our media, we're dominated by a, a purely kind of rationalistic scientific worldview, um, it just, it does make sense to me that if we accept that there is a God who made everything, who's ultimately responsible for creating the universe, uh, we can debate how he did that. But if there is a God behind all of this, um, it's not inconceivable that that God could choose to intervene into his, into his creation. It's not inconceivable that the same God who created all the planets and all the solar systems and all the galaxies, it's not inconceivable that he could also decide uh, to intervene into a woman's, vo into a woman's uh, womb and create the Y chromosome that would be necessary for a baby boy to be born. Uh, and I'll say more about that, but we'll, we'll look at that passage in uh, Luke 1. Um, so up until now, the first talk will be quite apologetics, but I think that the third objection, and this, this is often the objection behind all the other objections, is a lot of people just say, well, I, I don't, I don't actually, I don't care what you tell me about the truth of all of this. Uh, my issue is more about the relevance of it. Who cares about this anyway? And to deal with that, we'll actually look at another passage in Luke, Luke 7, where um, uh, Jesus, from a distance, heals the servant of a centurion. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he uh, presents a centurion as a model of faith. So it's a wonderful um, account. It actually shows just the, um, the extent of Jesus' authority. Um, that word authority uh, comes up time and again. And the centurion acknowledges his authority. And the centurion's response is a model to everyone, that he responded uh, in faith. And um, it's because of his faith that Jesus uh, healed, healed the man and, and, and uh, healed the servant and brought the servant um, uh, into health and saved him from, from death. And I guess that's a picture to us of what Jesus can do for everyone. And that's why it's relevant. That's really what's at stake here. This isn't just about apologetics and fancy arguments and um, intellectualizing. This is actually a life and death matter. And um, that's where I'll try and land the, third, the first talk. Um, so, um, the second talk then, I uh, hope you're all doing okay, I hope this is uh, still recording. Uh, the second talk is, did Jesus really have to die? Um, why is this such a big deal for Christians? Um, and I will uh, start off by comparing the, the Christian um, understanding of Jesus' death with um, how other ancient religions talk about the deaths of their founders. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how um, these days we often uh, just liken Jesus in a sometimes a sort of respectful way. We just think that he was a good man whose death was just um, another tragedy, much like we see with many of our modern day celebrities. <coughs> My point would be actually that Jesus' death um, <coughs> achieved the death of death. And it is actually in some ways the high point of his mission. And to do that we'll actually look at uh, Luke 23. Um, and you will see, I'll break this up into three points. First, he's showing what his mission was. It's interesting, in, this, um, in Luke 23, just the account of Jesus' death, you see a number of times, uh, three times actually, you see people saying, uh, you see there in verse 35, he saved others, let him save himself. Verse 37, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. In verse 39, aren't you, aren't you the Christ, save yourself and us. Uh, people there mocking Jesus. Um, saying to him, oh, look, well, you, you claim to have so much authority, why don't you use your authority to save yourself? Of course, it points to the fact that that's, uh, Jesus, absolutely, Jesus absolutely could have done that if he wanted to, but that wasn't his mission. His mission was to stay on the cross uh, to the point of death um, and obviously taking God's judgment on himself 
um, so that he might save others. So he could have saved himself, but he stayed there to save others because that was his mission. Uh, the passage then also um, points to his innocence. Uh, this is in the words of the other criminal who says to him, uh, says to his friend, uh, don't you fear God, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And it's an important point to make about the crucifixion. Um, uh, not just that Jesus was taking our punishment for sin, but he was doing that as an innocent man. Um, he was the only person ever to have lived a, a, a perfectly innocent life. And um, that's very important given the third point uh, about his victory. Uh, when you see the way he, he died, the way the sun stopped shining, the way the curtain of the temple was torn in two, these are signs of, um, these are signs of, of God's judgment being taken and then a victory being won. So the sun... Uh, the, 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 the sun stopping uh, shining is, um, is just a sign of God's judgment. It's a common thing from the Old Testament that when there's darkness, uh, God is in kind of judgment mode. And he certainly was in judgment mode on the cross, but he was judging his son, uh, his innocent son. And then the fact that the, the temple was torn in two, of course, is a sign that now the, um, the barrier between God and man has been torn down. The temple signified the barrier between uh, man and the Holy of Holies. And now that temple has been uh, torn in two. And with that having happened, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the second talk. I hope these things don't change totally between now and crossword, but uh, hopefully they don't. Uh, now, thirdly, um, did Jesus really rise again? I uh, hope you're all doing okay. We're on to the third talk here. Just get my notes in order. Um, <clears throat> did, Jesus really, uh, did, did Jesus really rise again? I want to start by um, just explaining what the resurrection was. We often think of the resurrection as just, um, you know, Jesus was this dead guy and miraculously his heart started beating again. Now that in itself would be a miracle, but the resurrection was something different. It wasn't just Jesus being revived. It was actually his body being transformed. It remained a physical body. It was a physical resurrection, but it was a glorified physical um, body. Uh, his body was different. And so I'll talk about that as an introduction, but then we'll, um, we'll go to this passage in Luke 24 where Jesus appears to his disciples and um, he eats with them. And so you'll see that he, um, uh, where is it now? Yes, he just appears. Um, while they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them um, and said to them, peace be with you. Uh, so he just, he could just appear in the room. There's something different. There's something um metaphysically different about his body um, but then it's still a physical body he can still um, he can still eat he can still eat fish um, so yeah in the lead up to going to this passage I'll give some of the other kind of classic evidences for the resurrection so we'll talk about what the resurrection is and then I'll I'll, I'll give some of the, the basic evidence for why we can know that the resurrection was true um, but then we'll end looking at these verses here where actually Jesus says what we now, uh, the message we can now proclaim because he's risen. Um, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached uh, in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So this is a, um, that's now the mission. That is what now people are called to go and do in Jesus' name. So those are some of the, um, the objections to the resurrection, and those are the things that I'll, I'll cover. Did he really die? Wasn't the body stolen? Weren't, they, weren't all the disciples deluded? Uh, and fourthly, I mean, a bit like I did in the first talk, I'll just try and deal with the relevance issue, because often you can give all this evidence till you're blue in the face, blue in the face but uh, people just um, 
remain deaf to it because they don't they haven't really thought about how relevant it is so that's what i'll that's how i'll try and close off the, fi- the, the, the third talk the final talk uh, is jesus really uh, coming back to judge um and here we'll go further back in luke actually to um or having firstly these two questions on the screen now why the confusion uh, we'll talk about some of the confusion to do with Jesus' judgment. And then, um, I mean, this will tie in quite a bit with what, with what Justin is doing in Revelation. So I'll make sure that I don't I duplicate all the stuff that he says. Um, but there are often a lot of stupid questions asked about the judgment. And people get so caught up in the details and they never stop to consider whether they are actually ready for Jesus to come back. Um, and Jesus' story of the narrow door is um, a good one to close on uh, back in uh, Luke 13. Uh, Let me read that for you. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, uh, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Now in some ways, that's an example of one of those stupid questions um, because actually he's deferring from himself. He's asking about other people. He wants to know how many other people are going to be saved. So Jesus comes back at him and says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. You see, Jesus doesn't answer his question. He doesn't tell him how many people are going to be saved. He turns the question straight onto this individual and says, look, you make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets (coughs) in the kingdom of God, God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. It's a great passage here because it reminds us of the importance of actually <clears throat> making a call. Everyone would have heard a lot of crossword, uh, but the key thing is to respond um, in repentance and faith. And in so doing, you enter the narrow door. Uh, you enter into salvation and fellowship with, with Christ. Um, a specific challenge here for those who are familiar with Jesus. Um, you see here verse... Uh, 26. Uh, some people here who are quite familiar with Jesus. We, we, we ate and drank with you and you, you taught in our streets. Um, but they, familiar, familiarity is not the same as relationship. Jesus says, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. And those people, even though they, um, they felt they knew Jesus, they were excluded. Um, <clears throat> there's a very a brief overview of the four talks. Um, it is, um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Please be praying for me. Please be praying for Justin and others. Please be praying for your groups and for your fellow leaders. And um, if you've got any questions, uh, you can email me. I will, uh, let me just write my email address here. It is... Um, as my email address, Murray at St. Peter's Fish Hook dot org dot ZA. Um, there's my email address if you want to ask me questions about the talks. Um, some books, if you wanted to, that you could read that may be helpful um, in the lead up to Crossword. Um, I mean, this wouldn't, this is quite, um, this is by Tim Keller, it's called The Reason for God. There'll be some chapters on there that are relevant to the stuff I'm, I'm saying. Really good apologetic stuff uh, in this book, Reason for God by Tim Keller. This is really helpful as well. Uh, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, a well-known book. Uh, this is a journalist whose wife became a Christian, and so he then wanted to investigate all the claims, and he went and did that, and this book is the result of his investigations. Uh, and then this book by Paul Barnett called... Um, the truth about Jesus. Uh, that's a thinner book than, than the others, uh, but all of those books I can recommend. And uh, looking forward to meeting you all in uh, a few weeks' time.
Okay. All the best.